of God, God Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's a pleasure, a pleasure to be with you with all you again. again. Uh, I am I Patrick Funston. I feel like this is maybe the, the first, first time that I've preached to a full house here. here. I've yeah. definitely been on stream before and had a few people, but um, it is good. It is good to see so many um, here. I'm the canon to the ordinary for the Diocese of Kansas, which means I work for the, the bishop, directly for the bishop. Um, but, uh, but we are also, my family and I, uh, also uh, attend St. Margaret's. Margaret's. Um, my, my, my wife grew up here at St. Margaret's, and my in-laws are still here, and uh, and so we're happy to, to be with you. And, and I'm happy to be here to uh, uh, give Marco a Sunday away, a long weekend away, and to, to share the good good word with you. I've been thinking about pivots this week. Pivots. Specifically, pivot points. Pivot points. Pivot points. Those, those points in our lives where, looking back, we realize that something shifted. That something shifted, that our life as it is now is different than it would be if something hadn't changed. Here I was going to make a, a, a joke about how being in Lawrence, we often like to think about pivots at this time of year, because when I think about pivots, I think about basketball, you know, and your pivot, your pivot point. And it's always nice in Lawrence to think about basketball at the beginning of football season, and then KU goes on and wins their first football game, and the joke just doesn't work anymore. I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate your, sympathy. your sympathy. But pivot, pivot points, points, those points, those in, points our in our lives. We have we kind have of kind private, um, individual, um, individual pivot, pivot points, points that are unique, unique to each of us. us. You know, like, like I, I, have I have one certainly, one certainly uh, when, when I graduated, graduated from, from seminary and I was ordained to the diaconate and then to the priesthood, my life is obviously very different than it would have been if that hadn't happened. But then we also have private ones that we share and I think are similar between all of us. Like, like um, that, um, moment that moment that, that, that my daughter, daughter was born. Was born. You know, I'm, 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 I'm different. I'm different. Things, are Things are different because my daughter, daughter was born. Or um, the, 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 the day that, day that uh, I started dating, dating Michael. Michael. Or the, or the time that I asked, asked her to marry me and she said yes. yes. Or the time we actually got actually married. Or, married or, I mean, that's, that's a whole pivot, pivot moment that's kind of ongoing and still working on. We also have like shared corporate pivot points. Moments in our shared life that changed, changed the, course the course and have changed, changed something, something about, about our world. world. We are just about to just celebrate, celebrate the 20th anniversary, 20th anniversary of maybe, maybe the biggest one in my, in my life, life other than the pandemic, pandemic. 9-11, right? Before 9-11, things were different. different. And now, now that 9-11 has, has happened, happened, and after, after the wars, wars in, in Iraq, Iraq and, and Afghanistan, things, things are different in our world, world right? right? There was there a was time, time, we will tell our children, when we, when we could wear our, wear our shoes, shoes from our from car, our car all, the all the way to the plane. The plane. Where we didn't, we have, didn't to have to confusingly, confusingly get shuffled, shuffled into either a metal detector, metal detector or, or the this the thing thing. thing. Right? Right. But Joe, but those, but are, those, those are, are specific, specific like, like changes, changes, you know? Yeah. And our life and our understanding of our own like security and place in this world is shifted because of the events of 9-11. Themselves a tragic moment, but something that also just shifted the way that the world was. For us, especially as Americans, and because of the position of America, I would say the world itself. I'm thinking about pivot points. Because when I read our gospel today, and I look at where it happens in the gospel according to Mark, I see this interaction with the Syrophoenician woman as a pivot point in Jesus' ministry. Do you remember where we were in our reading last, in our gospel reading last last week? Marco spent much more time focusing on James last week, so you would be forgiven if you don't remember. But what happened was we were told that Jesus was still kind of in and around his hometown. He was in and around Nazareth. And the Pharisees that were kind of following around, you know, with their dark suits on and their earbuds in, you know, kind of reporting back about what they were seeing, they go up to him and they say, we are noticing that your disciples, not sure if you know, um, they're eating with unclean hands. They say defiled hands. Because they built up this whole kind of structure of make sure you ritually wash your hands in the pots and everything else before you eat. If you don't, then that's a sin. That is bad. And Jesus pushes back on them and he says, you know what? They're doing okay. 
They're doing okay because the stuff that comes out of you is what defiles you, not the stuff that goes into you or what's happening on the outside of your body. What you've done is you've taken human precepts. You've taken this whole structure of cleanliness ritual that you've built up, and you're setting it equal with God's word. And it's much more important for us to follow the God who said to care for the widows and the orphans than the God who said, like, make sure things are clean. And then we get to today's reading. And we find Mark, being the shortest of the Gospels, is also the one where Jesus seems to be in the most hurry. And in our reading today, Jesus covers hundreds and hundreds of miles just in a few short verses. And we actually know that because of all the names and places that are listed here. We find that Jesus, after being sassy with the, with the, with the Pharisees, has run away. He's left. He's left Israel. He's, he's left Jewish territory. And he's gone up into Gentile territory to a town called Tyre. Tyre is in present-day Lebanon, up on the Mediterranean coast. He's made his way up there. And we're told very explicitly in the reading today that he's trying to hide. He does not want to be found out. He goes into a house in the hope that he will not be found there. But his infamy follows him, right? And this woman comes and finds him invites herself, herself into, into his presence, presence because she, she has, has a daughter, daughter who is, who is, who is afflicted, afflicted who's a demon. demon. And, and she, she has heard that Jesus can do something about it. So she goes in and she confronts him and says, I have this daughter. Please heal her. And Jesus has this very interesting moment that's hard to parse and hard to understand. What, is act, what actually is going on here? There is so many levels of like scandal that are happening here. Right? Jesus is a Jew outside of Jewish territory. He's alone in a house. And then a Gentile, and not only a Gentile, not a Jew, but a woman of Syrophoenician origin. So she's not only Gentile, but she's like super Gentile. She's like all, she's from all the way over in like Syria. Right? And she's a woman, comes and confronts, has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a Jewish man inside a house to ask something of him in Gentile territory. So Jesus is understandably a little perplexed by what's happening here, right? Not only am I trying to get a break, but you're coming to me with this request, and I am not even supposed to be talking to you. And you're definitely not supposed to be talking to me. She says, heal my daughter. And he says something. It's hard, hard to hear, to hear right? right? He says, he says it, is it is not right, right for, for the food, food of the children, of the children to, be to be given to the dogs. dogs. His, implication His implication is clear, is clear right? right? I'm, I'm here, here to heal and to teach and to teach care, and care for the people of God, God the Jews. And, and what, what I'm giving I'm is not for people, people like you. you. And she, she just, just takes it as it comes and gives it right back to him says, yes, yes but even the dogs are able to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. So anybody who has dogs or has been around dogs in a house knows, like, that's a really good metaphor, right? She knows, right? The dogs find the youngest person at the table, and they go stand next to them, right? That's where the food's coming from. It's a hard moment. And, and I want to just say that there's a lot there's a that can lot be going on here, and I don't want to get into a whole big discussion about what this means about Jesus and his infallibility and, you know, is he intending to offend her or is he being kind of Socratic and, 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 and asking this question that she knows she's going to answer correctly and challenge her. I don't think that we need to get into that. But I do notice, I think it is important to see, that Jesus behaves differently than what he had said, right? He hears her answer, and he says, you have answered well. And because of your answer, your daughter has been made well. Go and see. And she is healed. I think that this interaction is a pivot point in Jesus' ministry. I believe that Jesus always knew that his ministry to the Jews was going to also be a ministry for the whole world. And that all people, all people would be invited, invited into, into this, this tent of this thing that he was creating, creating that God was God doing through him. him. I, do I do believe that that was always in Jesus' mind. mind. But, there's but there's something, something that, that happens, happens in here, here to Jesus, Jesus that accelerates his ministry. His ministry, his ministry that in Mark, Mark is, is, that is already, already very, very quick. quick. 
And that's that's why why this second second story is kind of added on on to our reading today, today, right after. after. We didn't didn't skip any verses. verses. This is exactly exactly what happens after. after. We're told told that Jesus has this interaction, this challenging interaction. He's he's challenged and he he changes his mind or he fulfills what this woman's wishes. And all of a sudden now, for the first time, Jesus' ministry is for people other than the Jews. Up to this point in the story, he has only been working in Jewish territory with Jews. What happened right before this, with, the, with, the, with, the, with those Pharisees, right? that was preceded by the feeding of the 5,000. And in Mark, there's two different feedings. The feeding of the 5,000 happens. It's only to Jewish people in Jewish territory. But what happens then is, interaction with the Pharisees, runs away up to Tyre. And then we're told, maybe Mark doesn't know geography, or maybe Jesus is intentionally going into Gentile territory, because what we're told is that he went from Tyre, up on the Mediterranean coast, all the way down to the Sea of Galilee, into this region called the Decapolis, the Ten Cities. Every single one of them a Gentile city. And his interaction with the deaf man happens there, in the Decapolis. But not, but not only, only is he going, in, going is he staying in Gentile, Gentile territory, territory, but he's, he's actually, actually not going, not going on, a on a straight line. line. We're told that he goes, goes for whatever for reason, reason, he goes to goes Sidon, Sidon next. next. And, Sidon and Sidon is actually, is actually further, further north, north, further away, away from, Israel. from Israel. So he goes, he goes to the Decapolis by way of Sidon. Sidon. So he so skirts he Jewish territory, territory completely. completely. This guy who literally just said, I'm here for the children at the table. I'm here for the Jews. Is now making an... Explicit effort to stay in Gentile territory. And we're told that when he gets down to the Decapolis, he has this interaction with this man. Whose friends, he's deaf and he's mute. And his, his friends bring him. And he has this moment with this man, right? He takes him into private. Another private interaction. Another Gentile. But how different is it? Right? How different is it? Instead of this kind of tense standoff. It's intimate. It's connected. Jesus sticks his fingers into the guy's ears. Jesus shares saliva with the man. Spits and places his hand on the man's tongue. And Jesus says to the man, Ephaphatha. Ephaphatha. Jesus' native language, the language that he would have spoken most of the time, Aramaic, sort of in relation, it's very close to, to, uh, to Hebrew. Ephaphatha. Be open, he says. Be open. And the man's the ears open, his eyes, his eyes is, 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 is open. People, people are amazed, amazed and they proclaim. They proclaim. This interaction with this Syrophoenician woman is a pivot point, point for Jesus in the Gospel of Mark because, because it, accelerates it accelerates his ministry to the Gentiles. Because, because, he's, been because he's been turned around or because he's had this interaction, interaction he, starts he starts making more of an intention to be in Gentile territory. And his infamy grows. I think it was a problem for, his, for, the, for the Pharisees that his disciples were eating with unclean hands. We'll just wait till they hear that he's talking to Syrophoenician woman and healing Gentile men. And then we're going we're gonna to, next week, we're going to skip a couple chapters ahead, so you're going to miss this. So I just want to tell you, after he, he, ha- he heals that deaf man, the next thing that happens is the other feeding in Mark. Not the feeding of the 5,000, but the feeding of the 4,000. And that feeding of the 4,000 happens, happens in Gentile, Gentile territory, territory with only Gentiles. Gentiles. The bread of life, which was, which was given, given to the people. people.
what do you think you want to be able to say to them? I hope and I think that we have spent so much time in this weird, uncertain anxiety and for many of us, profound isolation that when we hear Jesus have his pivot moment and then transition that into going further away from his safety until he encounters a deaf man and he has this intimate, connected moment with him and he says to him, Ephaphatha, be open. I hope that we have had such a time in the middle of this pivot or that we can hear Jesus saying, Ephaphatha, Ekeba, be open. Be open. Open up. I think that this can be a moment where we can look back and say, you know what? There was St. Margaret's before the pandemic, and then there was St. Margaret's after the pandemic. There was the Episcopal Church before the pandemic. There was the Episcopal Church after the pandemic. There was me before the pandemic, and there was me after the pandemic. Because what I experienced in that moment in my life, and what I shared with my siblings at church, it came. It caused me to hear Jesus say, be open. And so now, when I see people in church who I don't recognize, I'm more open. I go and I speak to them. I introduce myself. I learn about them. Even if they've been here for however many Sundays. And I'm a little embarrassed that I maybe don't recognize them. I still do that. I take that risk. Because it was so painful to be in the midst of that swinging door of pivot and pivot and pivot and pivot. That I knew how important it was to, for, to connect with Jesus. I knew how important it was to be open. I was so isolated and felt such pain during that pandemic. And I recognized the pain that was happening to so many others. As fortunate as me during that pandemic. That now I take the added risk to invite people to church. To be open in a different way. To not just receive the people who walk through these doors with gratitude and graciousness, but to be abundantly gracious and to say to people, there's something to share, there's something to see, there is something special happening. Come and join me. This is a pivot moment. Jesus gives us an example, and whether he's turned around or whatever, he, something happens in him. And what makes Jesus an amazing example for us is that he takes that moment and changes what he's doing. He pivots. He does something new. So in this Syrophoenician moment, Syrophoenician woman moment, how will we learn from her? How will we be challenged by her? And how will we hear Jesus say to us, Fafatha, be open. Do something new. Do something different. And then look inside in 10, 20, 30 years and say, that was the moment where I pivoted. That was the moment where I pivoted. pivoted. That's the moment where I found myself with Jesus.